So our first speaker is Philip Cunio from Exoanalytic Solutions and Dr. Blind Flewelling, also from Exoanalytic Solutions. It's all yours. All right, good afternoon. I'm Philip, and uh, Brian and I are going to go through a little bit of uh, some work that we did thinking about the amount of data you'd be dealing with if you did STM and what some of the implications of that might be. For starters, we're both with a company that has a global network of telescopes, and this global network, which you can see roughly mapped here, includes right now around 300 telescopes. We collect a lot of data with that on a pretty much around-the-clock basis since it's around the globe. We collect around 450,000 images and around 600,000 OBS extracted from those images per diem, uh, which equates to in the tens of terabytes uh, of images of some kind of data per diem. So we're talking a lot of data collected and then used in the course of our business. What we do is not look at everything, though. We primarily focus on looking at geo systems. So we're tracking everything above to about 10,000 kilometers. If you think about space traffic, that's not the entirety of the problem. Uh, right now, there are some thousand, few thousand RSOs, resident space objects, in geo. There are many more in LEO. Uh, the numbers I have here, um, about 19,000 total is what I have, um, around 16,000 of those in LEO. Not all of them are active by any means. But what that means is if you, if you start with the number 19,000 and you look at what some of the plans for super constellations in the, in the near future are, some things are already being licensed. You're looking at potentially a doubling of the amount of systems up there. And what that would imply is that you're looking at uh, a very commensurate increase in the amount of data you would want to collect and want to use as well. So I took a, we took a step back and we said, all right, well, how much data would be absolutely too much? And what we did is we looked at a few examples of regimes where we think there's already a large amount of data that's being that's possibly collected in areas where basically humans have thought about how can we collect all the data there possibly is to collect in this particular area. And I'm just going to highlight three of those right here, compare them to STM. Imagine taking an image of the whole globe uh, every single day and updating it at around, I think this one is set for 0.1 hertz at one meter resolution in just populated areas of the globe. Imagine you want to figure out everything there is to know about a human body while it's performing some sort of athletic feat. Well, you might want to know all the way down to the cellular level what it's doing at some really high rate because there's a lot of really fast chemical processes occurring. And imagine that you want to track as an IT network for, say, security purposes, every single connected device on the Internet that's doing some rate of packets per second. Well, if you look at all those things and you make a few reasonable assumptions, you get to a data rate of around 1 to 5-ish uh, bits, E19 bits per day. That equates to the ballpark of 20 terabyte per second data rate. So I took a look and I said, this is what it, I think is a good way to say, here's the amount of data that's everything you could possibly want to know within reason. This is data saturation. STM is not at that level yet. But the amount of data that you might be collecting from it, if you're looking at all these LEO objects, including super constellations, is starting to get up there. It's uh, 6 E15 bits per diem. Um, if the amount of RSOs that we're looking at goes up and we want to track more of them and do more things with that information, like help prevent them from knocking into each other, then we're thinking then we're in, a, we're in a regime where we're going to think about a need to use a lot more data in a lot more ways. And it is a lot. Um, if you think about moving data around the globe, my estimate of taking a five-foot pallet of stacked with hard drives, the latest uh, high data density hard drives, and shipping this thing overnight, you're still not coming quite close to the order of magnitude of data that you would need to do this uh, data saturation level uh, <clears throat> movement of data. And this also wouldn't make any account of the fact that you might need to move this data from all around the entire world to various places if you had a global network as opposed to one single point A to point B transfer you're looking at. So this kind of data volume is going to be a serious infrastructural challenge to handle. And I don't think 
in, in the publicly known world, this is the kind of data infrastructural challenge that has been handled in the past. This is a whole new level of amount of bits we want to move from point A to point B or through an entire network. All right, so that's going to be an interesting challenge. What we do is we already do some small fraction of that with our 600,000 OBS per night, and we have a de facto way of going after that, which we call data depth on demand architecture. What that means is instead of putting all these bits in front of every single human whenever they want them, you just pick the ones that are most important first, and then you go back to the ones that have that are more rich in meaning later if the human requests it or if some process requests it. So you collect your images, you pull out the OBS, take the OBS, pull out state vectors, put that in front of a human. They have questions, they dive down into it further, they can all the way, they can go all the way back down and get the OBS, the images again if they really want to. But you don't put that in front of people to start with. So you start with something like um, the Plot, the plots in the middle there where you have tracks of objects moving all around, and if you have an analyst look at one of those and say, this looks weird, they can pull out the actual bits and look at the figure on the bottom, and they'll be able to say, oh, well, I see these pattern in the data that makes a lot of, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I want to see the real raw images. They can go even further back and pull out the actual raw image. Uh, the idea being you're not trying to cram all this through at once. You're waiting on some kind of need before you start to pull stuff through your network. And what that means is when you get to the point where you're looking at scaling this kind of data use up to your entire STM network, there's a few takeaways you can pull out of it. So we did a little uh, thought experiment here, uh, taking that population of 19,000 objects and just wanted to do something that was relatively easy to convey uh, to the collaborative community here to kind of parse this and contrast the uh, geo regime that we uh, routinely support today uh, with the infrastructure that we fielded and the services that we provide uh, to the things that we're seeing that are coming for LEO. And so while we don't claim that that's anything that we support very directly, um, there are some interesting uh, comparisons to make and some questions so that rises based on things that we've experienced in, in the domain that we do support very directly. So if you just take the volume of space above 200 kilometers but below 2,000 kilometers and you compute that volume and you take that 16,000 objects of the 19,000 and say about how many objects per cubic kilometer do I have, uh, you're, even when we add 15,000 objects to represent a number of super or mega constellations uh, to, the new to the LEO population, we're looking at on the order of two uh, times 10 to the minus 8th objects per cubic kilometer. Now, that's just a, a notional density number for comparison to the regime that we're tracking routinely today with, with our existing network. And if we take 3,000 objects and compare that to the local region around GEO, this would be GEO plus or minus 300 kilometers multiplied by a height of also plus or minus 300 kilometers. Um, we're seeing that this density number is, is roughly double uh, the density numbers that we're looking at right now. And that's simply to say that, uh, you know, there's a number of things that we do uh, to manage the traffic in deep space um, from either a regulatory or a best practices uh, setup. There's things like the ITU. Uh, we define clear slots. We, there's certain rules of the road that have, certain, that have been developed. Um, geo flyers also uh, go get their own information, whether that be from RF ranging or for other services like ours, um, to have in addition to the services that are being provided uh, by spacetrack.org and other uh, f folks that are providing information to support flight safety. Um, there's a number of things that are different, um, but if you draw some just very general conclusions from comparing those volumes and those notional densities, um, the fact that geo is denser may or may not uh, be that directly intuitive. Uh, currently, LEO has a very small, we'll call it an active participation rate. Most of the objects that we model are in fact debris. If they're communicative, they're just debris you can talk to because if they can't maneuver to avoid a collision, we're just watching what's happening. But there's a potential significant change in the demographics of that LEO population 
because the expected growth rate with these coming mega constellations is that you may have up to 50% of the population being active. And the question is, will that population also be maneuverable? And there are some significant implications that are associated with the answers to that question, both from a policy standpoint and from a how do we want to fly in the future uh, perspective. So Leo is a very different traffic situation. Uh, GEO has had some time to figure out some of their codified rules of the road uh, and best practices, um, but LEO in general is supported by fewer sensors, especially today now that we can provide a private service that have 300 sensors watching them um, with the exception of the six-hour solar exclusion roughly every five seconds for every object. Um, you have less time for post-maneuver evaluation. So right now, not every uh, active object in LEO is maneuvering, but they're considering it because they've heard about the space debris problem. They're saying, okay, if these collisions are definitely likely or going to increase in warnings and their frequency, one expectation is that I would maneuver to avoid these things or that I would do some form of station keeping. That changes the complete traffic paradigm as far as following that traffic pattern because the underlying assumption is that these objects will be ballistic for long periods of time. So given that there's more traffic and less time between these events, this suggests that if these data scalings that we're uh, suggesting here, this is going to stress human-in-the-loop processes. The, the amount of time that you have to turn around understanding what's actually going on from the measurements to actually see to any system to avoid a potential conjunction is short, which suggests needing to move to automated processes sooner than later. So some key questions. Um, just to pose as you think about this problem, as you read in the news about plans for thousands of satellites to come all at once to join this population, you know, do they represent a significant departure from the existing traffic patterns? Um, as the LEO density is increasing at an alarming rate, we're already seeing this in terms of population additions per year over the last couple of years. Um, are these going to increase the maneuverable members of the LEO population? If so, will this break assumptions, assuming long ballistic periods that we use to build our catalogs and to do correlation and data association in the first place? Um, this is either going to require a significant increase in coordination, just to keep everybody on the same page as to what their flight plans are and how these maneuvers uh, are changing things going forward, uh, or it's going to increase uh, the need for additional sensor support or uh, connectivity and automation, probably all three. Uh, you know, so are our sensing strategies sufficient for these coming changes? And uh, I would suggest to you that we should take some really serious uh, look at all of the things that people are talking about as far as collaboratively providing the information that we need to follow this problem. And then as these challenges associated with complexity, speed, and density increase, um, are we appropriately considering the big data problem that we've mentioned here that's going to come with it? Um, because we've provided some notional scaling numbers, and they, have been, they may have been shocking in the, when, when Phil started talking, but when you consider these confounding and exponentially increasing issues, uh, I don't actually think they're that far off. So thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Cluling. Our next speaker is Aman Chandra from the University of Arizona, and he is a mechanical engineering PhD student there. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm going to be speaking uh, on inflatable deorbit solutions for small satellites. Um, so uh, this is uh, the work that we've been doing at the University of uh, Arizona in collaboration with JPL. Uh, some of this work actually began as uh, uh, towards the development of an inflatable antenna, a spherical uh, mylar antenna uh, from a CubeSat. And, and it spun off into uh, also looking into um, the uh, drag characteristics uh, that such an inflated sphere could provide us. And that led us to uh, do a design um, of, of an inflatable system that could uh, possibly be used for deorbiting of, of small satellites. So this is, this is just a brief outline. I'll be going through 
uh, motivation, some strategies for orbit servicing, um, the deployable braking technology that we've been working on, um, and some concept designs that we are that we are continuing to advance to to uh, have uh, better better drag performance uh, from these inflatables. So uh, the motivation to our work is, is, of course, as you see in this figure, we've seen an unprecedented growth in CubeSat missions, uh, especially uh, around uh, the time of uh, the 2010, where you see an exponential growth. And this is an old uh, image, so, so the number is probably much higher even now. Um, uh, you know, new objects being added uh, at, a, at a very high rate in, in the LEO. Um, and now with, with advances in electronics, especially towards uh, in, in the area of radiation hardening of, of, of hardware, you can have CubeSats uh, go to a deeper space, and uh, that's where, where, where this problem uh, also starts to, to occur. Um, and so, as we know that at, at altitudes above 500 kilometers, aerodynamic drag reduces greatly, and, and this could lead to some of the CubeSats uh, launched of those orbits to remain in orbit way beyond 25 years uh, and then maybe even long periods of time, uh, which could lead to uncontrolled phenomena like, you know, has been theorized about uh, the Kessler effect. Um, there have been a lot of strategies for orbit servicing. Uh, these include the active debris removal uh, on orbit servicing, which, which have, uh, you have various concepts proposed like by the ESA to have these end effectors which sort of actively uh, grab uh, hold of, of debris uh, in space um, and, and, uh, and, and then sort of try to dispose them away. Uh, but these, these, uh, all of these concepts are quite mechanically complex. And, and uh, with the form factor available on, on CubeSat, especially you know, the 3Us and the 6Us, having the amount of volume is simply not, the amount of volume that we are available uh, is available is simply not enough to have a very complex mechanism in place. Um, and, and also, uh, given the fact that these mechanisms are usually uh, complex in deployment, that's an additional factor why we, we'd rather also look into uh, more simpler mechanisms to, to effect uh, drag on, on, on CubeSats. So uh, looking at deployable braking technologies, a lot, of, a lot of CubeSats have traditionally used uh, large deployed solar panels. Uh, to, to create that extra aero braking, uh, the drag that they need for orbit uh, lowering. Um, and and there have been all sorts of uh, linkage systems uh, that have been proposed uh, to, uh, as designs for braking devices, but they all have uh, the, the issue of design complexity. Um, with panels, again, you have only a limit to which you can have uh, such panels. So such, such kind of technologies are not sc scalable to very large sizes, and so the effect uh, that they can have is also limited uh, by those factors. Um, so if, if we were to quickly gloss over uh, these, uh, sorry. Oops. Okay, sorry. So if you were to quickly gloss over these um, numbers here, what we see uh, in the case of uh, inflatables um, very, very readily is that they have very low ballistic coefficients. And, and this is primarily due to the fact that, they, they, that inflatable membranes have some of the highest deployed surface to mass ratios um, and, and are easily scalable to large sizes. And then since they're pneumatically inflated, there's, there's, uh, there's really no complexity uh, in, in going from, say, a one meter size to a two meter or maybe a three or four meter size. Um, there have been some, uh, there has been some proposed uh, designs, uh, most notably by, um, by Andrew Space, uh, which, which has a CubeSat DRS design, and then there's some conceptual designs uh, called the Gold Concept, uh, but there's, there's not much information about uh, how these uh, works are progressing now, and, and so we, we decided to extend uh, the, uh, our design for an inflatable antenna to, to come up with a drag device. Um, and the, the basic, at the most basic level of design, it basically uh, any drag device would have a, a panel that, that's supposed to shield and take on uh, the maximum load um, um, along the velocity vector of the CubeSat uh, and have a support structure. All of this uh, is now, in, in, in our case, uh, adapted to an inflatable membrane. So what we have uh, is an inflatable sphere 
that's about, uh, we can fit something like a meter to 1.5 meters of a sphere into about a 1U uh, uh, form factor. And, and we were able to fit all of this into, um, into a 3U CubeSat with, with all the rest of the components um, inside it. The idea of this exercise was to see if we can have the inflatable uh, uh, deployment system as a, reg a part of, of the bus uh, and, and a, as a regular sort of component on, on CubeSats that might be uh, deployed in, in high altitudes. And so we've been working on developing a prototype system with a 0.5 meter uh, big sphere. There's a deployment mechanism. And we've under, undertaken a lot of tests in the thermal vacuum chamber to, to sort of um, uh, test uh, packaging and deployment of these systems. And uh, we're underway with a lot of prototype development. And then this is uh, another, um, another, um, uh, another area of work for us has been to look at how we can rigidize these membranes once they deploy. And we've developed prototypes um, which are al also about almost a meter in, in diameter with, with uh, UV resin. So these liquid resins are injected uh, in the membrane. And when exposed uh, to, to, uh, uh, to ultraviolet radiation, they, they harden. And, and they, they sort of become like this plastic shell, uh, which, which helps uh, retain the shape of, of the inflatable. So we've done tests of, of this inflatable in the vacuum chamber, and we've We've been able to show that it, it sort of uh, um, uh, sort of keeps its shape uh, once deflated. This is about a 0.75 meter uh, inflatable uh, that we tested in the thermal vacuum chamber. And then this is just a uh, quick simulation that we did of the of the deployment process. It's it's not the whole thing, but it's it just shows the the, the speed at which, uh, given uh, given the pressure that it's inflated to. Uh, its inflation process. Um, so we, we extended the concept uh, and we uh, came up with the design of a, of a conical uh, sort of And uh, we, we feel initial calculations, just first order calculations tell us that we'll be able to achieve a much better performance out of a shape uh, like this as opposed to uh, a sphere. And then these are some of the calculations we did uh, on, on the uh, drag performance uh, of the concept versus just a plain 3U CubeSat. And, and we see um, an enhancement of, of a drag coefficient. And uh, in terms of and a simple calculation on, on uh, the disposal lifetime gives us uh, a much better uh, disposal lifetime as compared to a plain 3U CubeSat. But these are just first order calculations to, to check the feasibility uh, of this concept. Um, then in conclusion, it's, uh, we just show a, a one new proto uh, drag, uh, prototype one new drag device. Uh, we've done uh, thermostructural thermo studies to show that it can be stable in LEO-like uh, conditions. Um, and then we've also gone on to propose a composite design, uh, which which sort of uh, further reduces, uh, with further enhances its its uh, capability with respect to drag. Yeah, so that's that's about it. Thanks. Thank you, Aman. And uh, the next presentation is also by Aman, so yeah. you can continue. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, so this uh, presentation was to be given by uh, my advisor, Dr. Jacob Tanga, but uh, he wasn't able to make it today. Um, and I'd also like to add to the credits uh, Himang Shukalida, who spoke here before. Um, this is much of their work, uh, and I'll just be uh, sort of filling in for them. It's, it's a, bit an ex ex a bit an extension to what, what I presented before, and so probably it makes sense that I present this right after that. Um, so this, this work is sort of extending the idea of using uh, uh, drag devices, uh, as we saw, inflatable drag devices on CubeSats. Uh, in, and in addition, we also propose um, a method. So, so since, since drag devices are, are mainly a method of, of uh, debris disposal and, and of, of the payload that they attach to, 
uh, it, it's not really um, an effective way of uh, capturing debris or, or of active debris removal. Um, so, so what we, we looked at uh, is in, in extending uh, this method is to look at ways in which uh, having a, a drag device on, an, on, a, on a CubeSat could be extended to also do an end-to-end -end solution in, in the sense that it, it also uh, uh, captures debris uh, in addition to disposing it off. So some of the work here is, uh, is, uh, is, is based on that. And then um, I'll come to the motivation for this first. Um, again, we, we all know that we need debris and disposal systems, uh, but what this uh, work sort of focuses on is an architecture that combines uh, debris removal and disposal uh, at the same time. Um, so a lot of, a lot of systems are, are proposed out there uh, have been for capturing debris, and, and there are tether mechanisms that have been proposed to, to actively um, uh, capture um, derelict satellites or, or, or debris created by these, but there's not that much work on, on disposal, on an active mechanism uh, to, to enhance uh, the disposal or the ability to uh, dispose of uh, captured debris. Um, you, uh, some of the background on this work is, is that of DARPA's Orbital Express and then the, the grappler fixture on, on the ISS. But again, these, are, these all are complex mechanisms uh, which, which have um, sort of deployment uh, characteristics that, that have taken a while for, for them to perfect. And um, they also are, are sort of optimized for, for well-known objects of, of well-known geometries. And, and with well-known velocities and, and state uh, vectors. Um, and so we wanted to propose a method that, that could sort of work uh, for scales, uh, that, that scales across different objects of different sizes and, and of, uh, of random geometries. So the objective was to come up with a scalable approach uh, towards tackling debris from a few to several kgs, maybe a few tons, um, and then to come up with an architecture that's able to combine uh, removal of debris and, and disposal um, uh, at the same time. Um, and then also to come up with a low cost system that, that with low control authority and simple deployment. So, so that's, where, that's where the idea of using CubeSats really came in is that how could we use a CubeSat to, to sort of have um, active debris, um, um, well, not active debris removal, but the ability to remove uh, debris and, and dispose it off at low cost and relative uh, mechanical simplicity. So the idea that uh, they came up with was to use a CubeSat-based system um, that can be scaled up in the sense that uh, the, the, the complexity of the system could be raised without, or the scale of the system could be raised without increasing uh, uh, complexity uh, of, of, the, uh, of the system. And what they came up with is an idea of passive debris capture and disposal. So in it, in, as opposed to um, effectors, end effectors, like robotic arms or, or tethers, where there, there are sort of, um, um, the, a part of the design is to actively uh, grab on to, to um, to debris, uh, this, this sort of method is, is not active in that sense. So, so the idea proposed here was to have uh, CubeSats that are tethered um, to maneuver to the location of the debris and to passively capture the debris. And, and by passively, I mean to go and entangle into the debris um, in a way that, that they also remain uh, sort of stable and then deploy these uh, inflatables to, to effect drag on the whole system combined. And, and this is where Himangshu's uh, work comes into play. Uh, so he uh, developed this uh, uh, dynamic model uh, for uh, the, the proposed system that you see here with, with three CubeSats uh, tethered together. Uh, he came up with this dynamic model that sort of uh, models how uh, the tether would behave when it's when it comes in contact with uh, with a with an object. Um, in in the case when it's when it's straight straight up hitting it, and in also the case when it's uh, spinning in three dimensions um, uh, with with random uh, rates of rotation in all three dimensions. Um, 
And these are some of the equations he used. And these are some of the results that his simulations have shown. Um, and this is in the case of the three cubes that uh, sort of geometry uh, striking an object running up uh, with, 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 uh, with the velocity along one component. And um, he's repeated these uh, uh, simulations with a cubes, uh, with a with a with an object that is um, sort of rotating randomly in all three directions in all three along all three axes, um, and the three dots you see here are actually those three cube sets, uh, which are sort of connected uh, via the the tether mechanism. So what what he found uh, at the end of this um, uh, at the end of this was that. The, he was able to see uh, the, the three cube sets stabilizing. Of course, the geometry in, in, of, of any actual debris is going to be way more complex than that. But as a first order analysis, uh, he does uh, find that he was able to see a stable, um, um, a stable uh, pattern uh, with the cube sets coming to rest and, and was able to entangle um, the, the, uh, the tether onto, onto, a, onto an object. Um, and, and as you can see, this, this uh, design is, is simple in the sense that it can be scaled in size just by increasing the number of cubesats you have with the same system. So essentially, you could, you could sort of keep increasing the size of, of this and the geometry of this network to, to uh, sort of target uh, objects that are much larger in size than, than what you saw in the simulation. And then we've already gone through this. Uh, this is, again, the... the, the the breaking device that we, we've developed. Um, and then the idea here is to be able to capture a larger uh, uh, spacecraft that may be derelict, that may, that may need to be manipulated, or may need to be disposed of by sort of capturing it with this network of CubeSats and tethers, and then deploying these drag devices to sort of uh, bring it down to, to burn up in the atmosphere. And this is uh, one new. Uh, system that we proposed. Uh, the idea of doing this model was to make sure that we're able to fit all the systems inside, whether it was even possible to have uh, a system like that in a, in a one-year form factor. And then this is, uh, the, in conclusion, we just we proposed a, a debris capture and disposal system. Um, since these are passive systems, in the sense that they don't require components that actively grab on to, to a um, to a piece of debris, they're highly scalable because, because they, they don't really need a change in design with, with change in scale. Um, and then first order estimates uh, so far point towards the feasibility of, of the design. In the future work, um, they're going to be doing higher fidelity simulations of the whole uh, tether mechanism and uh, a control system de development along with uh, analysis of, of different geometries. So that'll be all. Thank you. Thank you, Aman. Our next speaker is Dr. Mark Hedick, who is the Chief Engineer at Collision Avoidance and Risk Assessment at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Can you do the magic here? Thanks. Okay, this is a 28-chart deck, but we're only going to talk about the 10 charts that actually matter. Um, the issue at play here is what happens when we get a risk calculation that we know to be an understatement of the actual risk. How do we perform in such a situation? So let's move right along and look at what's called a conjunction plane plot, which is typically the way we look at a conjunction between two space objects. It's reduced into the so-called conjunction plane, which is a plane normal to the relative velocity vector. If there's going to be a collision between the satellites, it's going to happen in this plane. And what we do is we place the primary object at the time of closest approach here on this vector, and the secondary object here, and their separation is the predicted miss distance. This circle here represents the combined two sizes of the objects, and this large ellipse here represents the projected combined covariance or uncertainties of the two objects. And what we're interested in is when 
is it likely under which circumstances, what is the likelihood that this actual miss vector might be small enough given the uncertainty that it would fall within this combined size and actually create a collision? <clears throat> and that will happen, well, the, the probability is the amount of this probability density of certainty that falls within that circle. So a simple uh, two-dimensional integration in this plane, if you know this uncertainty volume and this size, can produce this probability of collision, which is the main index that we use in determining whether a collision is risky. Now, well, that's interesting. Let's come back here. What are the ways in which the probability of collision can be small? One way it could be small is for this uncertainty to be really small, because then there wouldn't be very much probability density that fell into this circle. And therefore, the integration would produce a small number, and you'd have a small probability of collision. The other way it could be small is for this uncertainty to be really large. Imagine this one sigma covariance is spread out over the whole wall behind you. Then very little of the probability density falls in this circle also. And the situation produces a low probability of collision. This is what we call the dilution situation. And the PC is not low because you have high confidence in your understanding of the positions. It's low because you know so little about the situation, you can't conclude that you actually have something risky. Uh, this analogy is sometimes helpful for people. Think of two cars parked in a really large parking lot, like the, the long-term parking at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. That's about the largest parking lot I've ever been in. <clears throat> if you know that one car is near one side of the lot and one car near the other side, then you can pretty much conclude it's unlikely that the two cars are parked next to each other. Sure, we could argue what near one side means, so therefore the, the probability isn't zero, but it's probably pretty low. Now take the situation where you have no idea where the two cars are parked. What's the likelihood they're parked next to each other? Again, it's really low. Not because you know anything about where they're parked, but you know in a really, really large parking lot, it's highly unlikely that two cars are going to end up parked next to each other. This is the equivalent of the dilution region P of C calculation. We know so little about the positions of the two objects that we conclude it's unlikely that they're going to run into each other, not because we know they're far apart and they're, they're safely apart, only because we know so little about the situation. So if we, in this parking lot situation, if we knew more about those two cars in the big lot, we might conclude they really are next to each other. But chances are, since we know nothing and it's a big parking lot, they're not. We'll skip that chart. So how do we resolve this situation operationally? Well, we now have to think about safety and how we approach the problem philosophically. And first thing we need to recognize is safety is not an absolute judgment or calculation, <clears throat> but a judgment call, something that's done through heuristic and prudence. There's a trade-off between safety and cost slash convenience. For example, we could probably eliminate highway fatalities by forcing everyone to drive a car like a Hummer and set the speed limit at 20 miles per hour and strictly enforce it. But we see the cost and inconvenience rule out that possibility. So this brings us to what we at CARA use as our statement of principles for CA. And of course, autocorrect has hurt me. But to take prudent measures at reasonable cost to improve the safety of flight without placing an undue burden on space operations. That's worth saying again. Prudent measures, reasonable cost to improve safety of flight without creating an undue burden. All of these words like prudent, reasonable, undo, these are from legal terminology. They're not established clearly by scientific investigation. But what it means is that safety is a judgment call. We don't have a mandate to overinvest in safety. Just because something makes something safer doesn't mean we should necessarily pursue it. And affecting how the mission performs affects whether we really need to remediate in a certain situation. When we perform these analyses operationally, even though we don't think about it this way, they have the unwitting uh, properties of hypothesis testing. When we calculate a probability of collision and we compare it to a threshold to decide whether we should remediate a situation, that defines a critical region on the curve, this region where if, it, if the factor exceeds it, we will actually do something. If we calculate a confidence interval about that and compare that, now this starts to sound like a p-value. If you put it all together, it looks like we're doing hypothesis testing. That's not a bad thing. But if we're doing it, we really ought to think carefully about what the hypotheses are that we're working with. Namely, if we have a hypothesis and based on this probability of collision, we accept or reject it, what is this null hypothesis that's lurking behind it? How do we structure that? Uh, one set of publications in the literature sets the CA null hypothesis as requiring remediation. It says, we presume the missed distance between these two objects is smaller than their combined size. So therefore, we presume they're going to collide. And you have to prove that they're not going to. And if you can't prove that, you should maneuver. But there are a lot of reasons why that's really not a very good formulation of the problem. 
first of all, the typical situation is two objects that come in close contact with each other don't collide. They don't cause a collision. Usually you set the null hypothesis for the typical situation. There are also inherent risks to remediation. Every time you send a command for a satellite to move, the thruster might stick, the software might glitch. One way to take those risks into account is to set the null hypothesis in the opposite direction. And finally, to do a remediation action is not just enough to have this probability of collision over the threshold. The state and covariance data have to be of a data quality that's acceptable. The propagation situation, meaning usually space weather and LEO, has to be stable. So a default of not remediating makes more sense if you're doing hypothesis testing. So where does that leave us in the dilution region? In the robust region, where we, <clears throat> we know which sides of the parking lot the cars are on. If the probability of collision is high, we conclude the situation is risky. If it's low, we conclude it's safe. When we're in the dilution region, which we were just talking about, if the PC is high, we conclude the situation is risky and we should do something. If the PC is low, we actually can't draw a conclusion. We can't say that the situation is safe, like we talked about before. But when you can't draw a conclusion, what does that mean? It means you can't reject the null hypothesis. So if the null hypothesis says do nothing, in these dilution region situations, you should do nothing you don't have any good reason to suppose there's going to be a collision. Yes, you know something that may make you a little nervous, but if you can't demonstrate that there's going to be something unsafe, then the best thing to do is to do nothing. Is that a good policy? Well, let's think about it in terms of untracked debris. Recent modeling says we've got as many as half a million, <clears throat> 500,000 space objects, the size is greater than a centimeter, enough to render your satellite, you know, essentially cause mission failure. We track about 22,000 of those. So only about 5% of the actual conjunctions we even know anything about. That 5% could be described as events with insufficient or inadequate knowledge to do something about. What is the description we would use for events in the dilution region? Insufficient or inadequate knowledge to do something about. All we're really doing is extending that 95% just a little bit more with these dilution region situations. So by not acting in those situations, all we're really doing is the same thing we were doing for all this untracked debris, the risk of which we accept simply by launching the satellite in the first place. And when the space fence comes online, which you've all heard about, or Leo Labs gets their stuff fired up, <clears throat> we're facing the same situation but writ even larger. People have worried, what are we going to do with all these dilution region events when the space fence comes online? Well, the problem actually, from our point of view, is self-correcting. If we're in the dilution region, the PC is high, that's a risky event, and we should do something about it. <clears throat> if we're in the dilution region, the PC is below the threshold, there's not enough information to do anything. That's no different than today before we turn the space fence on. All that stuff is up there causing risky situations we don't know anything about. When we turn the space fence on, now we know about them, but we accepted all that risk yesterday before we turned it on. Why are we suddenly going crazy now that we know about it? If we don't have enough information to draw a durable conclusion, we should do nothing. That's the most reasonable approach. Now, some could say, well, OK, but can't you do something in the dilution region to assess maybe a little better what your likelihood, what the real risks are? Um, we've got a lot more charts on this, but I'll summarize the situation for you in words. There are two proposals we examined. One was from Sal Alfano of AGI, who said, what if you massage the covariance to push the P of C to as high a degree as possible and looked at that? Another is a guy by, named Michael Balsh. He said, well, why don't we just reduce the overlap of the two error ellipses down to a very small amount? If you do all that study, and we ran profiling over the last two years of conjunctions, these are the <clears throat> two parts of the table I want to focus on. This is the ratio of number of remediation of, um, events we, have now, or we would have in the future using one of those approaches to what we have today. If you use the approach that Sal Alfano recommended, we're looking at about a factor of two increase in the number of remediation events. If we use the Michael Balsh approach, we're looking at factors anywhere from seven to 10. Maybe a factor of two we could live with operationally, but when we get the space fence, we're getting a three times increase in the number of events we expect anyway. So this is really an increase of six. That's more than we can handle operationally now, and here we're looking at increases of 42 to 60. Those are not acceptable. So, <clears throat> dilution region events with low PC, they're a problem, they're unfortunate, but given our operating parameters, we think we can make a good argument for setting the null hypothesis for not taking action in these situations and treating them the same way we treat all the other untracked debris. And if we do come up with a proposal similar to what Sal Alfano and Michael Balsh came up with, 
that would allow us to do something in those situations. Then we focus on <clears throat> the second part of our you know, operating principles, which is preventing an undue burden to operations. If those conservative approaches can be executed and still not produce an undue burden, we'll consider them. But when the burden becomes large, we think the best thing to do in this case is to do nothing. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Heddock. Floor is now open to questions, so please go ahead. Matt, have you just basically argued that we need to just get better data to get out of solution making? Um, I think that that definitely is is important. Uh, we will still have to decide. We will never be able to track all the untracked debris, so we will always have some. <laughs> You know, if we go down to one centimeter, then we're going to want to go down to one millimeter, and it's, it's going to be impossible. So there's always going to be this edge of untracked debris that we have to manage. It's going to be a decision maker's call on how much additional data should be procured so that we get to a level of safety that we're happy with. One approach that I think shows some promise that's been used in the past is to try to make sure we have adequate data to prevent collisions that will themselves produce large amounts of additional debris. And for those that will merely render a satellite inoperative but leave it largely intact, maybe that's the point at which we draw the line. That's at least, you know, whether that's the right answer, I don't know, but it, it's at least a consistent and understandable position. The last point is that your argument is probably a lot more difficult to make for manned spacecraft um, from the standpoint of creating more debris. That's, that's your, your last point. Um, for human spaceflight, I think there we would equate mission failure with loss of life, and it's a different lens to apply. Yeah, yeah. But you, you, I think you know roughly the, the, the number of observations you need in order to get something off of the, the heuristically, you kind of know that if you get um, three, two, three, four radars that are capable of tracking an object um, around the world, that it's uh, uncertainty reason I think so. And that should keep us in the robust region where it's straightforward. Yeah, so that's, you know, if you think about this from the goal of where we would get to, it's kind of three, three, four radar. It's capable of seeing an object in space. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I think I, be, I agree with you that um, current practice amongst, if you talk to the commercial <coughs> operators anyway, is that they live in the, um, the dilution region and their practice is not to do anything because they know if they do something, they'll waste some fuel. So that's where they are now, and that's why they do go out to commercial things to, to get the better observations. I have to agree with what, what Ed is saying. And I'm, I'm hearing a lot of um, discussion about the space fence and how it's going to open up this huge realm where we had no information. We will now have some information. We'll still be in the dilution region, as you say. But I think we're better off. But people seem to forget that for the things that we're tracking now that are bigger, we should, if the, if the thing works correctly, have better information on those objects. So net-net, we're better off. So the sky is not falling. Mm. Um, um. I also want to touch upon a, a thing, another bit of sky falling, which is when people talk about these large Leo constellations that are coming. Um, and we've heard some of that talk today. I'm looking at you, Brian. Uh, right here. And, and so, you know, you, you dump in a thousand or so active satellites. They're probably, they're certainly active. They're most likely controlled. They're valuable assets. People care about them. Um, but still 99% is debris. The debris was and remains the problem. And you're not going to change that by just putting in some constellations. If you manage them correctly, so they'll become more of the problem. What people seem to forget is if you're worried about dumping in a couple thousand objects that are controlled, you should be very worried, as Darren McKnight, who's not here yet, as far as I know, talks about these clusters of very large objects, um, defunct satellites and defunct boosters that are sort of co-orbiting in some very valuable things. When they, when they do, in fact, collide, which is not if, it's when, um, then we will have a large LEO constellation of debris uncontrolled. Um, and so I think if you're worried about the Leo constellation, you should be worried about the other thing because that's the clear yeah, and, and, and it was not meant to yeah. imply that you shouldn't worry well, about that. This is, right. This is, this is, right. This is the sky's falling that we're hearing a lot. And I think people need to remember there's, you know, let's, let's, let's yeah. weigh these risks and what's really important. 
Well, one, one element of the risk that goes typically overlooked is that, as uh, Ed Lewis said before, you're as good as your last data point, right? So you want to have timely data post-maneuver. And so if your general assumption is that the preponderance of the LEO population is unmaneuvering, then you're going to design data strategies that are less frequent. And if your maneuver frequency is going up for a larger fraction of that population, you need to scale your data strategies to be sampling post-maneuver. And so you need to think about over what fraction of that population am I reconstructing that trajectory so that I can have an updated state vector that represents the post-maneuver state, which is not a typical hypothesis that we make for most of that population. And so it's just the key point we want people to take away. One thing I think we, it bears remembering is that most of these all of them will have onboard GPS receivers. So we will have as much low covariance information on them as, as we need. We don't have to share the data. Yeah, it, well, that's, mm -hmm. that's part of the space traffic management, isn't it? That's, that's mm -hmm. the key regulation point. But that doesn't cost really any extra money, per se. That's just, you got to do it. If you're going to launch, you got to do it. Let me make a, a statement about data, um, where I think we do need more data for sure, and getting out of the dilution region is important. But it's also important to remember that in CA, we live in a world of prediction, not of fit. And especially because remediation actions are usually a lot less uh, damaging and perturbative if done a few days in advance. Usually, we're trying to make a decision what we think will happen in a few days so that we can act on it. The biggest source of error there is not a data inadequacy problem. It's an atmospheric density forecast error problem. And along with the procurement of additional data, we need to be resourcing also better research on atmospheric density forecasting so that we can make these decisions with more precision in a few days' time so that the perturbations and therefore the resistance to remediating conjunctions is lessened because the effect on the owner-operators also is lessened. That's an excellent uh, question. That, that could be a whole other presentation I would have liked to give. Um, a parallel area of research that we've invested a fair amount in is trying to determine whether a collision is likely to produce a large or a small amount of debris. Uh, the NASA ODPO, Orbital Debris Program Office, did a lot of research on this about 10 years ago and came up with some algorithms. And we think now if you can estimate the mass of the debris object, you can get a good sense of whether the collision will be non-catastrophic and produce maybe tens of objects or fully catastrophic and produce thousands. That could be a very useful discriminator. And at least the way our thinking is evolving now, maybe in the dilution region, you go ahead and speculatively make a large change if you think you're facing a catastrophic situation. And if you think it's a non-catastrophic situation, were there a collision, maybe that's when you, so that would be an adjustment to the null hypothesis that we showed today. So I think that's right. Oh, well, okay, I, I, here I think you have to think of your reference frame, because there are two, and at, at NASA CARE we have to deal with this problem. There's protection of the orbital corridor and keeping it free of debris for future use, and then there's d defense or protection of the individual mission. What we've learned is that those are two kind of parallel paths to walk down. As a mission operator, you can be as conservative as you want. If you really value, you, and you think you have the fuel and world enough in time, you can move all the... When, from a regulatory point of view, we have to put together regulations for what missions must do to protect the orbital corridor, we limit our sphere of inquiry simply to the debris problem. Please go ahead. Thank you. 
So you, you manage that by, by choosing the threshold at which you are going to accept this. Second thing is about the uh, space plan. So it should give us better data about the objects that are currently in the catalog, but it's also going to add tens of thousands of objects to the catalog that are only seen by one sensor. And so the data for all of those objects may, for every probability of collision calculation we do, that may be always in the dilution region and never has enough good data to get us out of the dilution region. Yeah. Unless they help. <laughs> That's right. Um, but let's also remember, whatever sensor system we deploy, there will always be an edge of detection group of objects that will have poor data quality. Right. But ideally below what would kill a satellite. Marcus? Um, it does, and, and it's a prescient question because one of the, I mean, Jeff Braxton isn't here now, uh, but there have been discussions about maybe we were too aggressive in the past, uh, especially after the you know, Iridium Cosmos event. There was, a, there was a rush to catalog the results from that, and maybe in that aggressiveness, we cataloged a lot of things that probably shouldn't have, we'll put quotes around that. There's some question whether they should have been put in the catalog because they weren't reliably trackable. Or obtainable. So all they did was create headaches for users because you had eight old vectors that you didn't really know what they represented. Um, so there's been talk about, well, for the space fence, are we going to be more uh, cautious about this and only place into a circulated catalog things that meet certain quality criteria and, and ignore everything else? Aware that there could be a post you know, challenger situation here, too, where there's an awful event and someone goes through these logs and finds the data that only if we had processed it, we, we could have prevented that. Um, I think there's an open research area here for what to do about this ambiguous group, where we do have some information. We don't have enough to meet the general criteria for cataloging that, that might be assisted by a human or handled by the current operational systems. And that, that would be uh, welcome at one level, but as somebody who deals with CA policy, I, I feel the new headache beginning. Namely, what do we do with that information that isn't being processed by vetted systems but is sitting there ready to be exploited to keep astronauts from being killed? I'll give it a shot. Um, I'm not sure that operators necessarily start maneuvering more often. A lot of that is probably going to boil down to the decision processes that they're going through with their, at their organization. And um, in LEO, there's probably going to be a wide range of organizations. So if, if super constellations fly, it'll be one command center or one set of command rules for maybe 5,000 satellites. But there's still, you know, Five to 10,000 others. And some of those are going to, especially in LEO, are going to be operated by universities. And their decision process is going to be whatever the undergrads decide. I, so I, I can't say for sure what will happen there. Um, I, I think there is actually an argument to be made for there being, as someone suggested at another conference, a sandbox level. So some section of LEO is set aside where that's where we can let anybody go play, right down really low, where as soon as you screw up, no problem. You'll be pulled out of orbit by the atmosphere within a few months. It'll be fine. Um, again, so I don't know if the, if the second effect will be a lot of 
directly a lot of you know organizational attention paid to it. I'm sure some organizations absolutely yes, they will panic. They will say there's a 0.008 percent chance we might crash. I spent so much time working on the satellite. It's so expensive. It's so important. I don't like that. Um, You'll just see a, a really wide range. So it'd be hard for me to come up with a, a concrete answer. Are you looking for some other specific things? I, I yeah. think I would pile on that a little bit. Um, you know, I've heard a few different things in this discussion, or you've heard about the consequence of the overall risk and, and how do those people in those different domains assess their level of risk. Um, part of that is just how much valuable is this asset to me? How much commerce do I depend? To expect to derive from its existence in the space domain in the first place, and then what is the co overall consequence to the whether it's Leo or Geo regime, right? So we've had collisions in Leo; it's happened, right? Luckily, we, we've witnessed and have shown some data actually in our presentation today of an actual breakup that was at Geo. We didn't focus on the actual video, um, but you can read our papers on the AMC9 event of a couple of years ago um, about things like that. Um, but those are significant consequences to have large debris producing events in, in geo that impact everybody. And so the calculus is, is completely different. I think the goal of having these additional remote sensing systems is to provide enough data such that the advisories that are derived from its processing are actually actionable with some low degree of quantifying confidence so that they can again, believe that they can plug it into whatever their decision calculus is, right? So that there is this trust relationship that needs to build up between those who are flying the satellites and those who are providing these support services such that the transactional data that goes between them is reliable. And I, there's, there's a long way to go in some of these areas, especially if we're changing the entire demographic in the case of LEO, in case that there may be a huge influx in people who fly differently than the systems had before. Uh, and so all of that, and, and our point today is all of that is leading toward observing more often, observing for more locations, and observing through more modalities. Because um, uh, everyone's got a stake in driving commerce from, from space, and so everyone's equities need to be represented. But um, getting onto some common level of calculus to how you quantify that risk and how that relates to the information that's being provided to them is really the goal. And the, the last suggestion that you might hear is that uh, it makes sense to have some kind of a set of best practices for things like that. And it's hard to say right now which organizations necessarily be the promulgator of those best practices. I will note that I've heard in the past that, say, insurance corporations are possibly well, su well suited to, fit th to play that role, given that they have plenty of time to sit and go through all the math and the expertise and all the non-intuitive things to say, here's some nice heuristics to say, this is when you maneuver, this is when you don't worry about it or else you don't get your insurance. Any more questions? I had a question for Aman on your presentation. So have you done any analysis on how robust your attitude control systems need to be for the tether mechanism? Because you know, what if you're tethering around a rapidly tumbling object, and what would be the the consequence of the momentum imparted by that object on those CubeSats and you know, analysis on the control systems and the formation flight bounds, uh, or is that a work in the future? Um, I think I'll direct that question to Himangshu. It's been his work majorly on it. Yeah, so Do you want to come up and speak on the mic, just in case? Uh, yeah, so uh, our initial study was actually, it's like a very passive system, okay? It's okay. like uh, three CubeSats connected by a passive tether, and it goes and like hits the target object, and because of the change in the momentum, it kind of captures the object, okay? So now uh, we, uh, our approach is like we will have like additional control over these CubeSats. Once it goes and wraps around, and then they would be able to position itself to where we want to kind of grab and deploy our uh, drag device. Okay, so that further control will be through MAMS-based uh, electrospray uh, uh, propulsion system. Okay, so the idea of the passive tethers is just to uh, kind of do a passive docking. Okay. 
Does that answer it? Or? Yeah, and I guess I'm kind of, kind of wondering if those, let's say, electrospray systems, would they be robust or responsive enough to respond to the attitude control bounds you would need to capture a rapidly tumbling object? Or are, are the studies you're doing for more, uh, let's say, passive objects that are not tumbling rapidly that you know, are more well-behaved? Mm -hmm. okay, yeah, so yeah, obviously like we would need some initial estimate of our uh, target object, where it is, at what rate it's tumbling, okay? Sure. Yeah, and without that, we, uh, it will be like, kind of like hitting in the dark, right? So we need those initial estimates to actually move the entire system towards that and kind of do the gripping. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. There are no more questions, then uh, we can adjourn for a short break and uh, please join us back at 5.15 for the late afternoon keynote by Eric Stalmer, President of the Commercial Spaceflight Federation. Thank you very much, and a round of applause for our panel here.